there no paper? Yeah. So can you can you stop a moment? Yeah, of course. And fix the... Yeah, no problem. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> Okay, so I start again, <laughs> no problem. So, okay, thank you for the invitation uh, to talk here on in the basic notion seminar. Uh, and uh, the title is Superlinear Structures in Conformal Geometry. I'll talk on uh, both subjects, which are very basic and simple uh, concepts, more or less from uh, in the beginnings of linear algebra, both of them, and repeat them in, uh, the context where I combine this superstructure with conformal group gives so-called super conformal groups, and there are not many of them. Uh, the, the one with the richest structure is connected to four-dimensional space. And, and uh, the main part of the talk will be what is the representation theory of this super conformal group and what are the consequences uh, for physics? I think there are consequences, which I think are not up to my knowledge, not uh, observed uh, in physics. And the problem there, we will come to that point, is um, the representation theory has the problem that there are the problem of non semi simplicity of representation categories, which looks like a disadvantage, but it may be something which is interesting. And that's the point I'm going to. And that's the whole motivation for my own considerations of this subject. You see, this is basically motivated from physical theories. So um, there's this standard model. I, I do not want to go into details, but most of you will know what it is. You have uh, forces, internal forces, which are uh, have gauge theories from the groups U1, SU2, SU3. There are several generations, not so important, but if you do it in uh, Minkowski space, you have, of course, the, the relativistic geometry is governed by a non-compact group, which is your target group, Lorentz group, or the uh, universal cover uh, the SO2. And the representations of the, these groups uh, occur, especially of the universal cover, is the, the spin of representation, two dimensional. It's a two dimensional spin of representation which plays a role in the standard model. It's not the four dimensional one, it's the left spin or it's the half spin of representation, two dimensional standard representation of this group. And um, there's a lot of, there's a long history, the standard model. Um, uh, the, the problem is you see many groups and there's a lot of uh, activity uh, over the last uh, 50 years to unify these forces into bigger groups, this grand unification, and also to combine uh, the relativistic symmetry with the um, internal symmetries. So there are this uh, bunch of uh, grand unification uh, embedded into E8, E8 uh, and, or uh, have a whole series of such internal forces. Also in string theory, you, you consider uh, Higher dimensions, uh, most uh, famous ones are the 10 dimensional uh, string theoretic setting uh, instead of four dimensions, and the so called anti Sitter space in five dimension also appearing in string theory. But the point is, there is, I think, 50 years approximately ago, uh, a theorem of Coleman and Mandela, which uh, says that under a reasonable physical assumption, which are Technical assumptions on scattering amplitudes, holomorphicity of the as an city of, of the scattering matrix. Uh, it is shown that um, you cannot combine the compact groups and the dynamic groups like SU13 or the covering group into one big classical Lie group uh, unless uh, it's a direct product. So you cannot really have a unification where these are pieces of a larger group, which is say simple. 
And this theorem then uh, later on inspired a lot of activity in theoretical physics, supergravity theories, and so on. Fourth, which uh, tried to avoid this by not considering Lie groups, but super Lie groups instead, because fermions play a fundamental role in physics. And so the, the thing I will focus on is this semi simple representations versus non semi simple representations. Because the point is, once you allow supergroups or super Lie algebras in their representations, the representations are genuinely non semi simple. Whatever you do, operations tensor product, you uh, get representations here definitely not semi simple, completely different to the classical picture, which you have either for compact groups, you know, by Peter Weil, it's everything direct sum, even the Hilbert space setting. And also uh, in the setting for dynamic groups like SL2C, they are non compact Lie groups, but the representation theory in physics is, is tied to unitary representations for the indefinite. Dimensions, but even uh, if you leave that, you have non semi simple uh, But that's not the point here. So the two structures, which are, I, I assume uh, to be relevant, is the super structures coming from Fermi and Bose statistics. You have uh, uh, super symmetry uh, is building on this uh, ambiguity you have, and then the conformal structure because. If you look at the standard model, it's uh, it's uh, invariant. It, uh, the 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 the, the homotopies operate on Lagrangians, so you have uh, in, in enlarged uh, symmetry beyond the uh, uh, classic symmetry, at least in the most important case where you uh, look at su supersymmetry uh, of a certain group where you have four Fermi degrees of freedom. Then you have scalar invariance, and that's the most important. Model. So that's the physical background. Uh, I'm not a physicist, so, but that's what inspired me to think about this structure. So first part of my talk, let's do math now. So it's just I want to remind you, simple reminder on what is uh, a super representation. And then I will embed it at the end uh, into what is the structure, very abstract structure, tensor category. But, um, my focus will be on semi-simple tensor categories versus non-semi-simple, so I will uh, shortly discuss. This. So let's start with a uh, use here. This is not a piece of chalk somewhere here. So uh, it's better to write on the board here. If, um, if you take a field, let's say carries to zero, a nice field, uh, then you can consider an algebra, which is commutative, but by extracting a square root out of an element of K. Call this algebra uh, alpha is commutative algebra. If alpha is zero, it's a Grassmann algebra of dimension two. It's commutative algebra, but it's naturally set two graded because this is even, if this is odd if you multiply, even and even it's odd if you multiply odd and odd, it's even because you land back in the ground field. And if you apply even times odd is odd, or odd times even is odd. So this is a two, so two graded algebra commutative. And it's well known if you have two commutative algebras, which are set two graded and the tensor product, Again, it's commutative algebra, set two graded. But this requires that you agree that you multiply in the usual way you do it in commutative algebra by reordering. So this underlying Convention is that you have an identification between who cancel products over the field K by mapping X tensor Y. Well, I will choose a sign factor because we come to the super case in a second. So here, the sign is not there. You just have this underlying convention for identifying. Uh, these two different tensor products. And if you make this sign identically one, you get this multiplication law because 
You apply this, if you move this here, it's a tensor product identity where you uh, have B in A alpha, uh, B in A beta and alpha prime here. And you just exchange the two orders and you use such an underlying identification. And if you, this convention, you get a common unit algebra. But you have a set two gradings, you can also, no. we leave this case, we can also use the sign rules, of course you would, where you say, okay, where well, I have to define the degrees, uh, what is the degree? So um, I write this as, well, I have to, indexes, this is the even part and the degree is zero. And you have the odd part, which is this, the degree is one. So if I write this, it just means erase the bar and this is set to graded and I don't write it otherwise. So it's the usual rule for differential and calculus uh, alternating forms. If you use this, what happens for this new rule, uh, this is the super tensor rule, you have again, if you do this, that if you go back and forth, it's the identity. And in fact, these isomorphisms are functorial. If you have linear maps between them, if you think of this as vector spaces, it's functorial. Uh, but what you get in this case is, well, it's the same tensor product as before, as spaces, but the rule to define the algebra. This dot there's a different one. You have introduced an epsilon, yeah? And by abuse of notation, just to remind you, I put the epsilon here. You have now a different convention for exchanging. I'm right epsilon for the non-trivial one. Then this is a Clifford algebra. It's non-commutative. It's that two grading. Non-commutative. In fact, if alpha and beta are k star, then it's, it's a division algebra, Bertonian algebra, and uh, this algebra splits. If, for instance, you put this, then uh, it splits and becomes isomorphic to the two by two matrices over your. SVK. But what you get is an additional set two grading. This is a simple algebra, not a special. This is, uh, 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 not necessary, it depends on alpha. Well, Take, so yeah, in this case, it, it, it's a quaternion algebra, a simple algebra. If, if, if you are in, in K star, this is a simple algebra. But put uh, alpha and beta equals zero, it's a Grassmann algebra. No, it's not simple. Uh, can be Grassmann algebra, also alpha C Grassmann, Grassmann algebra, dimension four. So it's this sense not simple, super commutative in this case. But the point is, you have a set two grading. So, and this set two grading looks like this matrices of this type are even, what is the even part, and matrices of this type. Are odd. Usual rules, even times even, or odd times odd is even, and the remaining products are odd. So it's a set two graded algebra, and this is what the superlinear group is. So now you can take arbitrary um, the matrices N and M, take two integers, and then you can do block matrices. So you to take uh, N by N, M by N. And then you can define the, I, I better write it like this. You, you get the, well, I, I write it like this. Becomes set to break it. Algebra, but, but the same rule. Yeah, it's obvious because if you multiply two block matrix of this size, you get block matrix of this size. So this is a set two graded non commutative algebra. But the point is, uh, it's well known uh, for everyone who knows what a Lie algebra is. And I, think, I suppose everyone knows what a Lie algebra is. If you take the usual commutator, makes this into a Lie algebra, 
However, you have a so-called super commutator. If you have an underlying grading, the super commutator makes it in you know, the S for super, super algebra. So what is a super commutator? I don't explain. It's too complicated here and too boring. The sign rule, uh, you can rewrite this definition of a super Lie algebra in a more convenient way. It's a super Lie algebra is an ordinary Lie algebra. It's the even part. As a vector space, it's a direct sum, even or odd. Uh, the even part is a Lie algebra with a usual commutator of the bracket. G1 is a G0 module in the sense of Lie algebra module. And then you have a bilinear map from the odd part to the even part, which is symmetric if you exchange these two variables. And equivariant, we call the a joint rep representation matrix. This is a G0 module itself. This was by definition a, a module. And so this should be equivalent. In fact, this encodes the super commutator in an elegant way. The structure above tells you what the super commutator is on, on this with itself, this with this, and the odd super commutator. The super commutator, it's an even pair. It's a symmetric bilinear map from the odd part yeah, to the even part. And then you have the Jacobi identities built in this. The only thing where the Jacobi identity has to be formulated is uh, if you start with X in the odd part, then you, this throws it in even part, you can apply the even part on this module and then it should be zero for all inputs. That's a super Lie algebra. Okay. It's a bit weird if you look at it, but that's the most convenient way to put it in terms you can really work with. So it's nothing bizarre, it's very easy. Now, but now a little bit abstraction. So one can uh, define a so-called tensor category. What is a tensor category? I will explain in a second. I want to try to make this precise, as precise as possible. I have to be a little bit sloppy. But a tensor category is, is a, it's an abelian category, like category of vector spaces. You have exact sequences, kernels, cocons, and so on, axioms. On a abelian category, they want it to be k-linear. It means the homomorph, homomorphism spaces, uh, where uh, our vector spaces. So the homes are uh, also uh, k-vector spaces. There's a k-linear category. Uh, I'll come to this in a second. And so if the objects are created, it's finite dimensional spaces here and here, yeah, finite dimensional vector spaces. Uh, usually one writes uh, if x, uh, zero is Km, x one is Km. This is the broad way of notation for a superspace. Homomorphisms uh, uh, are required to preserve the grading. This is this rule. But it's linear homomorphisms in the category of vector spaces preserving the grading. The dual is just the component wise dual. Of course, you have the dimension, which is the, the sum of the dimension, but you have now a new dimension, so called super dimension, which is the difference, these two. It's an important concept. And the reason is this concept here is an invariant of the tensor category, world, whereas the dimension is not. And then you have the symmetry constraint, and here I require this epsilon, and uh, we already saw. So in this category, what is a polynomial? Uh, it, it's just a polynomial in the first variables and a Crossman polynomial in the second ones because of this symmetry rules. If you write what a, an algebra is, you can do it by diagrams. What a commutative algebra is, you can do it by diagrams in a category. And if you do this, you get the polynomials are the symmetric powers, but by this uh, sign rule, uh, if you really write it out, it's, it's symmetric in the bosonic variables and anti-symmetric in the variables. Okay, fine. Uh, and this is an example of a so-called tensor category of a field. Tensor category of a field is a, I said it, an abelian category. Homomorphism are k-linear vector spaces. Yes, so yeah. All axioms of an abelian category have a monoidal structure. It's a tensor product. And in, in, uh, you have a unit element, which is an object. object uh, if you tensor with one, nothing happens, but you have to certain axioms of compatibility. And then you have this symmetry. What is going on here? You have this uh, symmetry constraint. 
um, sigma, which I saw two examples. Uh, sigma is the just exchange, it gives you so category of vector spaces, and with this twisted uh, Koshul epsilon, it gives category, tensor category of super vector spaces. And then if you want to talk about an algebraic tensor category, require that all homes are finite dimensional. There are vector spaces, and you require that you have a dual vector space, a dual object, which is the Tanaka dual, I explained in a second. Uh, certain axioms for the duals, either you phrases in terms of category theory, joint functions, but essentially key identity uh, we all know from linear algebra is this one. So if all these properties are satisfied, then we have an algebraic tensor category over K. And the typical examples are vector spaces and this super vector spaces, but also representations of a super group, an algebraic super group G, which are finite dimensional over K. Uh, but it's super representation, so it means that it's a two graded representation. And uh, I will not explain what a super representation is because it's not important for this talk. Uh, I think everyone can figure it out in, in a second if he has a minute time. But the relevant point is I will explain you what a supergroup is. I only thought about what a super algebra is. So a supergroup. Uh, here, it's like a super Lie algebra, it's a triple. For Lie algebra, we had a classical Lie algebra. Here we have a classical algebraic group over the field K. But this is an algebraic group like GLN or whatever. This is a C1 as before and the B as before. If you erase this and replace it by its Lie algebra and call it fraction G0. So, a supergroup is nothing but a classical Lie group, and you forget the Lie group structure, you require that this Lie group acts on the G1 instead of its Lie algebra. And automatically, if you replace, yeah, you require a group action here, but then replaces by a Lie algebra, a Lie algebra acts. So, by definition, uh, algebraic Lie supergroup has a Lie algebra by just replacing the group in the even part by its Lie algebra. But it's nothing mysterious. And what a representation is, it's easy to be figured out. It's a representation object, if you formulate it in terms of diagrams, in this tensor category of finite dimensional super vector spaces. You can, what an algebra is, what a Lie algebra is, what a representation is, can be written in terms of diagrams. If you do it, you get what the representation is. And this category of representation is a, is a tensor category, so it makes sense to. If you have two representations to define their tensor product. But keep in mind, their representations by definition are finite dimensional representations. So, tensor product, again, the finite dimensional representation. And these categories, yeah, the problem is these categories, T, finite dimensional, here I should put an S, uh, hopefully I didn't forget it. Yeah, super representations of. I don't write bold face here. All my supergroups are bold face on the backboard without bold face. This is a algebraic tensor category. Oh, okay. However, as an abelian category, it is not semi simple, almost never, yeah, except for trivial reasons. For instance, if the supergroup is an ordinary group, meaning that this is zero, of course, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, and the group is reductive, you have, uh, you have the classical simulation and semi-simplicity of the category. So then one, it's natural to ask, um, I write here the limit. So the, the main statement is a Tanaka statement is that every algebraic tensor category, at least if it's finally generated, so generate by tensor product of finitely elements, is a representation category of some supergroup. This supergroup then is a finite dimensional Lie supergroup. But you can get rid of this finitely generated because every tensor category is a, a union, an inductive limit of finitely generated subcategory. So in general, the classification theory, you have to replace, replace by a protective limit of algebraic supergroups. 
And there's this mu, this mu is just a homomorphism into the classical group itself, which says, uh, which indicates its eigenvalues of the non-trivial element here. If you have a represent, representation of G, uh, you get a map into the endomorphism of the representations. The minus element here, its eigenspaces give you the even and the odd part of the representation. So the mu encodes the, the um, superstructure of the representations. So this is a complete set of data. So every supergroup with, with, with the mu gives an algebraic tensor category and vice versa. The question is, when is it semi-simple? Well, hard to say, but if it's semi-simple, if and only if, um, let's assume it's finite generator to easier grasp the concept, but it's only taking assumption. If the, the supergroup has a finite unramified covering, which is only in the classical part makes sense, of a classical algebraic reductive group, and a certain type of supergroups, which are so-called orthogonal symplectic groups. This is very exceptional groups whose representation theory is uh, indeed same. But if you have that all super dimensions, uh, now I have to define what a super dimension is. Uh, now I have don't have because of this classification theory. These are representations in super spaces, so it makes sense what the super dimension of the representation is. So you can do it a priori, but a posteriori by this theorem, you know what the super dimension is. If the super dimensions of all objects are greater than zero, this is an old theorem uh, um, of Saavedra, but corrected by Deline that in this case, it's a, just if the group is classically reductive and mu is trivial. So this is uh, our Tanakan statements. And the, the, the essential point here, and that is a key point for this lecture is, as I said, for supergroups, the representation usually are, usually are not same simple. But there is a so-called tensor functor. This is a semi-simplification. Semi-simplification functor. It's called omega. And this is a semi-simple tensor category, something of this type. It almost looks classic in this sense. You can really say what it is. And this uh, could be anything. For instance, an average very algebraic tensor category. Uh, so something of this type or a supergroup G and certainly the semi-simplification is exists, but is very complicated to describe. And it has sometimes crazy properties. So th these constructions were studied by Andre and Kahn 20 years ago, but goes back to a uh, uh, study of motives and was introduced first, I think, by Uwe Janssen, who constructed a category of motives uh, of finite fields. Now, this is a very nice construction. I don't go into the details. Uh, it is unique if it ex exists. Yeah? It is, it's a tensor functor. The tensor functor, so it's a functor of abelian categories. It's an exact functor. It's a tensor functor. It commutes with tensor product, and so on. And uh, it's unique, yeah. And uh, yeah, okay. And we will study this later for. G, the group GL or SL, MN, the V algebra I introduced before, but what the classical group behind it is, of course, the general linear group. So the, the G, zero, uh, what's the group? The classical group GLN plus GLN, and the Lie algebra of G1. It's just the matrices, as mentioned before, which are odd in the M. Plus n matrices. And the map B is just the ordinary matrix anti commutator. I don't write it. Yeah? It's the most natural representation uh, you have. Uh, and for these groups, I will study the semi simplification. And I give you an example just to, to show you what is going to happen. If I take uh, 
C to be the group. CO2 cross G. One one is boring. Yeah, I don't <laughs> write it on the board, but the, the first interesting case is the group G, uh, GL2 slash two, which means four by four matrices. And you have a GL2 cross GL2. Something interesting happens. If you take this tensor category in this case, and you take the tensor subcategory, which is means you take here all irreducible objects in T, so it's the tensor subcategory generated by the irreducible objects in this category. So it means to take all tensor products, all direct summons of this, add to them, take new tensor products, and so on and forth. Um, you'll go to this same simplification. If I don't restrict to this, it becomes too complicated to write down. I don't want. So I restrict this omega here and the image, full image is a tensor category, which is same as simple sitting in here. And something very strange happens. This, by this theorem, is equivalent to ordinary representations of a classical group. So these factors don't occur. That's the reason why I was restricted to the category generated by irreducible objects. It's tensor category generated by a group T2, classic group, but it's not a classical group. It's a projective limit of groups, as I said, because you take all irreducible objects. It would have taken finitely many. I would here get a classical group reductive, but here at all, which is a countable infinite number, you get something which is quite large. This group uh, is the following, um, it's a group. I don't give it any detail. It has a homomorphism to the multiplicative group. And the kernel is more easy to describe. The product from zero to infinity of the classical group SL2C over, over C, your case C, or any algebraic closed field of characteristic C. So this group you start with, and our representations, or even the subcategory, representations of a finite dimensional supergroup. It looks harmless. It looks like GL2 cross GL2 plus something odd. But then the simplification kills many, many objects. So there are much fewer objects in here than in here, and of course, much fewer objects here. But the representation of this the underlying Tanaka group is not a finite, finite type algebraic group, but a limit that is very large. You see the complicatedness of this super representation is really already at this example, showing up for the first time. Okay. So now I come to the second part, which I, I'll do uh, rather quickly. Uh, is there something to erase? Yeah, here, I, oops, I'll erase one of the simple things here. So conformal uh, groups, I will be very brief uh, on that, but uh, I'm, I think it's not so important except for one point. Uh, I made some interesting points are this here. Oh, let me start. So what is a conformal group? Uh, I think everybody knows <laughs> the classical thing. So you have a vector space, a non-degenerate quadratic form uh, of the reals. Um, and let me write it in the board. This is more convenient. You have a, a R to the N, a quadratic form signature R comma S. And then you have the usual orthogonal group, R, S. And uh, these are conformal with respect to the generalized metric. And then you have translations. These are definitely isometries here. Then you have scalar uh, maps. So we scale, which are conformal. If you uh, take these together, they generate a group which are called P, this is generalized Poincare group, but not the reason for P. This would be the Poincare type group, but this is a parabolic group. 
in the super in the in the in the in the conformal group. The conformal group uh, G conformal is generated by P and an involution star, uh, as usually in in, in orthogonal groups, is isomorphic to O R plus one S plus one, where the involution you can uh, define as follows. You take any sigma, here is uh, not so important, but in a minute, if it, it in fact is important, you just take the reflection on the, on the, on the, on the unit ball. If you take the Euclidean metric, it's just X divided by uh, absolute value of X squared. This is a conformal map, uh, and you know, in dimensions more than uh, three, these are the only conformal uh, elements uh, here uh, and their product. So this is this group. And of course, these are only densely defined. So you have to define, only defined on a dense open subset of Rn because you have the, 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 uh, the serial locus of this quadric has to be removed, but you can still define it as a, some, some, some meromorphic, uh, so to speak, uh, group. But in fact, the Lie algebra is easy to see that acts by in polynomial vector fields. So the conformal group is a nice group acting by vector fields, but not well-defined as a group action is a well-known uh, thing. And um, you have one possibility to uh, repair this. And this is uh, rather interesting now for my talk. Uh, it's like if you make a reflection <laughs> in a classic case, let's say S2, uh, R2, you reflect at the unit circle, the, the point zero moves to infinity. <laughs> That's the only annoying thing. So if you add a point at infinity, replace R2 by the, by the Riemann sphere, you get the usual Möbius transformation, everything works by. fine. And the same you can do uh, in every situation, you just, uh, you have uh, here dimension N plus two, you remove the point zero, uh, take the pro real protective space and uh, take in this the zero locus, which is defined because this is a homogeneous equation of this extended quadratic form here. And then this is a quadratic of the same dimension as the Rn. And you can easily show that Rn embeds and it's equivariant embedding. Both you have natural action on the conformal group on this quadratic, so on this space. And this is an uh, uh, open dense subset, the Minkowski space or this Rn in this case. And uh, the vector fields act equivalently. So this is the conformal compactification. Uh, I do not want to comment uh, further uh, on this uh, thing, except that I want to say that the same construction of conformal groups uh, should work uh, should work for uh, in the supercase. So if you replace uh, Let's say R4, this is the subspace that's most interesting in physics, the, the Minkowski space with the Lorentz metric. You should be able to add odd pieces, uh, I have written in red, and construct a conformal group or supergroup or a conformal super Lie algebra. Um, but in fact, this is possible in four dimensions if you make certain natural assumptions, but not in higher dimensions. It's not possible. So in fact, if you require that the conformal Lie algebra should look in a very specific way, namely it's the Lie algebra of the original group and some group which you leave open, it should be uh, anything, classically Lie algebra, but you require that the odd part is the spinor representation of the Minkowski group. So that's the essential repression. It looks like it would be essential. Uh, requirement that this part acts here as a spin representation. We make this requirement, which is usually what the physicists do, uh, then the only case is four dimension, nothing beyond. So there are no really interesting uh, supergroups, conformal supergroups, which have the nice property that the even part is really generated by the image of this map from this symmetric map called. Uh, we're looking for now super relations, these are things like that. And we call the, what, the symmetric map, equivariant 
to be zero. And now you assume that uh, if you take the image of this map and the generated subspace of this image, you require, the, you, know, you not even require that it's uh, G zero, but you require it. it's containing, this is an assumption. It's containing the S E O R uh, classical group. If you do this, uh, almost no go beyond that dimension. And uh, proof is not very difficult. Uh, concerning the Spino assumption here, which I made, uh, this is quite a natural assumption because the weights here are very small. This is the adjoint representation. And you have a symmetric map. You, it's non degenerate on a, on, a, on a vector. And you can see it's non degenerate on the highest weight vector. So the highest weight vector cannot have weight beyond one. So it must be weight one half. So you have Spino representation must occur, but the assumption is the only type of representations are multiples of Spina, half Spina plus or minus. So then it's quite re restricted, but this is the usual assumption made in physics. You have Spinos, which should generalize the Dirac, uh, uh, Dirac fields. So there is almost nothing. So what remains is this case SU31 or 1, 3, is the remaining case. And the question is, is, is there a superconformal group? Uh, or uh, you can also say SL2C, which is, let's say, the isomorphic, that's the covering group, uh, the recovery group. So in this case, is there such a conformal supergroup? The answer is yes. And it's something, uh, an exotic exception structure. It exists for stupid reasons, which, which are exceptional isomorphisms in low dimension. Uh, if you carefully analyze the proof why it exists in dimension four, uh, you see the proof is exactly the same why the Lie group E8 exists and the as exception, largest exception proof. The proof is almost similar. Uh, there's a proof by Witt, which I like very much. And if you look at Witt's proof for the existence for E8 and why there is no construction beyond, you find the proof uh, can deduce it carried over to the to the uh, supersymmetric case. So you have this uh, superlinear proof, which is already quite complicated. I, I cannot write down it, its formulas. It's too long, it's too tedious. Uh, but the principal idea is very simple. Oh, sorry, it's written here. You have to find a super involution and then you define this, the complexification of this four dimensional conformal uh, first for the complexification and then the descent to the, the real form uh, by polynomial super vector fields on this super space, which means polynomials in this variables and Krassmann, no, the polynomials are polynomials here and Krassmann polynomials here. Vector fields are derivatives with respect to the bosonic variables on our far, usual derivatives. And you have also super derivatives where you derive, let's say, a Krassmann uh, variable. You just take it out of an alternative uh, polynomial. You can make derivatives also in the super polynomials. So yeah, can they decrease uh, the decree? So a uh, vector field is something where the co coefficient, coefficients of the vector fields are super polynomials and the derivatives are with respect to bosonic and or fermionic variables. This is a graded uh, algebra. Once you find an involution which extends the involution we get here. You can make the following definition. You look at all these polynomial vector fields on this super Euclidean space, such that the convoluted uh, differential operator, you apply first the involution on the polynomials, uh, on, on, on the functions, then act with this uh, vector field and then switch back. And uh, if you require that the uh, con Convoluted differential uh, operators again polynomial coefficient operator. You see immediately that this is a graded vector space and must be finite dimensional because of the grading. So that's very simple. Once you have such an involution, and the point is you don't find an involution in higher dimensions, but in dimension four you find because you can identify R of R four with the Hermitian two by two matrices as usually done in physics. Yeah. And uh, theta is two odd variables. I just uh, think of the first case where m is one, then it's theta one and theta two are two Krassmann variables. 
you know, the Crossman polynomials are constant plus constant times theta one plus constants times theta two plus constants times theta one times theta two. And on these polynomials, the Chill two group acts because this is a C2 complex. And the Hermitian matrix can be inverted on a dense open subset. Of course, you have poles. This is like in the classical case. And the inverted matrix also acts on the odd part because uh, the two by two matrices act on the uh, vectors in Z2. Or whether they're even or odd, the formula don't, doesn't care. You see, it's an involution, it's densely defined. And you make this definition, and what pops out is exactly the conformal supergroup you're looking for with the desired properties. So this group exists and Key point is, so I don't comment anti and string theory. I think this is only interesting for physicists. Uh, physicists very often consider the anti space, which appears in 10 dimensional string theory, but the anti space is a double cover of this conformal compactification I explained before. Uh, recall we have this conformal compactification by this quadric. This is a compact manifold oriented, but it's a etal, an unramified. Uh, um, covering is uh, the boundary of this under the sitter. And you know this, uh, what is called uh, under the sitter, uh, CFT correspondence. There are fields on this boundary correspond to supergravity on, on the under the sitter. So this fields on this uh, boundary or on this uh, compactification is what I'm having in mind for applications because if uh, such a theory is con super conformally invariant, the representation theory of uh, our group comes in. So now I come to the last part of the lecture, which is, I cannot go into details here very much. Um, the group here, you can replace it. This is uh, exceptional Lie group uh, business, like here, the Lie algebra here, the conformal, and also the super algebra. Um, you have an exceptional isomorphism, which identifies the complexification of, of our, is SU2 two is the same as the conformal, the algebra um, and it's a classic uh, without super. But if you do this, I, I put here an M, you get an SL4. But if you do fermionic variables here by this bizarre construction, what you end up the group becomes very simple. It's the SL we saw before. So it's well known and easy to get uh, hands on. In, uh, and that's the reason why I can prove something with the SL4. But it is an exceptional thing, only exists in dimension four. Most of the computation here really. Uh, depending on this low dimension. But this category here is quite complicated. At least if M is, yeah, if it's really super case, M is not zero, there's a classical SL4 and tensor products are not understood. Irreducible representations are just the irreducible representations of the even part of the group. So this completely well known by Amman Weil. Uh, the irreducibles are very easy, but there are infinitely many of them, non-isomorphic ones. Tensor products are completely non-understood. Whereas in the classical case, you have the little bit Richardson rules where you can calculate tensor products, uh, all simple groups. And the category is wild, which means if M is bigger than two, which means that in the composable objects cannot be classified. That's very hard to understand if you're not a representation theorist what it means precisely, but it's very complicated categories. Then uh, the, the, the next point is you can, here this is Levy filtration. If the category is not semi-simple, you can, uh, and it, objects are finite dimension, you can filter by irreducible, so take the maximal semi-simple, the socket, the, the maximal semi-simple sub-module, you divide it out. The question is you take the next maximal semi-simple, the socket again, and you get a filtration. This is so-called Levy lower, uh, the filtration. The length of this filtration is bounded, and in our cases here in the conformal group, at most by uh, nine. You have most nine steps of filtration. But nine is very much. Yeah? You will see in a minute why. This is quite uh, awkward. But the whole category looks a bit weird, so it looks at least completely different than uh, what you know from standard one. Everything is tends to be semi-simple in, in representation theory. What you can have there is continuous spectrum, yeah? But you disintegrate, but it's nevertheless you have a, a decomposition. You don't have anything like that here. Okay. And 
what is the main theorem? What, what do we know? We, I already explained this semi-simplification functor. And the point is, what does it do? Uh, if you put hands down on it, um, this functor kills certain irreducible objects and everything that goes with it. So if you have an irreducible object L with super dimension is zero, then omega of L goes to zero. It kills all irreducible objects with super dimension is zero. Uh, okay, that doesn't look so bad because super dimension zero might be a tiny subset. But uh, when supergroups came first up, uh, Victor Katz classified them and also tried to understand their representations. And he coined the notion of typical and atypical representations. He could manage the typical representations. In fact, irreducible ones. These are exactly the ones which are projective, so same simple. And for them, they found, he found the character formula like in the classical case. And all the rest, he called atypical. But the strange thing is, if you throw a coin into the set of uh, irreducible representations, so to speak, the coin would almost 99,99% 99 .99 hit a typical representation, a representation with super dimension zero, which is projective, but goes away. What remains are the atypical representation, but even not all, you have a whole bunch of atypical representations in, in the, in the case here, we study we have zero R typical, which means typical, one R typical, two R typical, three R typical, typical, and four R typical. This is maximal R typical. And the only ones that survive don't have this condition are the maximal R typical representations. And this is a very thin subset, which is combinatorically is not easy to describe and not really understood uh, and looks very bad. And but the nice point is the kernel of this map can be exactly described. An element goes to zero if and only if it's a direct sum, a finite direct sum of indecomposable objects whose super dimension is R. This is the kernel of this functor. So the objects that go to zero. That means what? Super dimension zero. So all the objects which are direct sum of indecomposables. Because it's not semi simple, you can only decompose in indecomposable objects, all those which are the finite sums of indecomposables, where each indecomposable has super dimension zero. This is the exact kernel. The objects are the, which go to zero in the semi simplification. So only maximal atypically survive. This was a conjecture of, of cuts, and it is proven by now. So you could also say the surviving representations are the maximal atypical representations. I do not go into the details here. So you see the coin here is maximal atypical. These are the, 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 the most complicated guys. And these are exactly the guys which make the category non-semi-simple. That's the same feature because the whole category decomposes in blocks. So the direct sum of our building categories, there are no extension between the blocks. And the maximal atypical are, are one block and that's the black where the highest Lewy height arises. And if uh, N is different from M, you can easily uh, compute the Tanaka groups and reduce it to equal case, which is the most interesting and the most difficult case. So I come uh, to an end. So there's many things to say. I want to say something on the Tanaka group. I explained it in this special case. The same picture happens. The case one is considering here, and the physical uh, application for the conformal group is dimension four. It's the Minkowski space. This is uh, because of this exceptional isomorphism between O2, four with SL4 or GL4 with a, uh, a group that contains it times M. And as I said, the conformal invariance, the most interesting case is here four, because you have an invariant measure here. It's dx1 up to dx4 e theta one up to e theta eight. Recall we have r to the four times super two dimensional super space tensor m. If m is four, you have eight variables here. They scale with square root of these variables. The odd variables uh, 
scale with the square root. So this is an invariant measure. But in this case, the most interesting case, you have this, I showed you what the result is here. The result is more complicated. And uh, I, I skip all these things. Uh, you can compute all this uh, interesting invariance here, which I think is not so important. What I want to show that is atypical representations are classified, wait a minute, yeah, by certain diagrams. So the irreducibles which survive in this functor fall into 10 families, or to be precise, 14 families. What you see, they are uh, indexed by trees. And there are four points, which comes from the fact that we study here G44. People would look at GLNN, they would have N knots, the trees. So we have here in the four dimensional case, so we have trees with four knots. This is a tree, but we look at forests. It is a forest with one tree maximal height. There's a forest with a tree with has two branches, a low uh, uh, tree with three branches. There are two trees in the forest. There's uh, three trees in the forest, so four trees, <laughs> young trees. And there are trees with one single root, you say, especially these, 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 no, these, 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 these have um, one node and the others have more. And I wrote certain groups below. And these groups play exactly the role that the group SL2 did here. What is this sum? This sum is over all representations in two families. They have two families here. The one family consists of nu equals zero. This is the trivial representation. And it belongs in this case to the analog of this tree, but only with two knots. This is new equals zero. This is, F, this, is this tree here. You have n equal to two, so it looks like this. And all the others from one to infinity, they correspond to a forest with two young trees. But the point is, this is a family because you see, if there is more than one root, you can, in a forest, they can have a distance. Yeah. These are trees, three of them, and you can have certain distances. This is a variable. And so for each distance, a possible distance, you have an irreducible maximal atypical representation. And in this case, uh, here, the new, uh, more or less, if you have this, this is a new equal to one. If you have one point distance, new equal to through, and so on and forth. You see, there are two families, but they all contribute Oh, sorry, no, uh, I really, no. These all from you know, equal to zero, one. This means distance is zero, sorry. Distance is one, excuse me. And this one comes from this representation. Because I switch between GL and SL, forgive me, this has a reason. The conformal groups have SL, but I compute with GL, and the GL adds a certain determinant, like in the classical GL theory, which is so-called Barrison determinant, which is important only if from a more general point of view, which I come to in a second. So these are infinite families, infinite many members. But you see, instead of the group SO2, which appears for this family, you have certain classical groups, which depend for every representation in this family, you have to add in a product, SU 24 here for every independent of the distance, an SP. And each of these irreducibles generate an independent copy of a group. This is like this. You start with some finite dimensional supergroup, but you get a countable number of things. They become independent. And that is much reminding of physics situation. If you look at the standard model, the groups don't have anything to do with their direct products. When you have generations, we call that three are found many copies, several, at least three. So that's the point. And you see, if you do the smaller case here, very often it's three from you, only got two from uh, you, only variables, the kind of maximal is, is smaller. In this case, you have only these four families. And in this case, it's, it's much like GL2 
equals two. If only these two guys. And if you look at these two guys and freeze these two rules, you see it's this and these two, it's exactly what we had here. So it's an inductive structure. And all, most of the proofs use this inductive structure and certain cohomological functions. So I come to the last point before I finish. I should say that each of these families has a, a unique member, namely these representations have dimensions and they have super dimensions. You see, the super dimensions of the representations, which are here, is one, two, six, six, 12, 24, three, four, eight, 12. That's the super dimension. But they have a dimension, and the dimension depends on the spacing. If the distance is zero, this is the unique basic member. It's the smallest dimension in this whole family of representations. What you see in this group is only controlled by the super dimension. It's always SO2. This two is the super dimension of all these irreducible representations. And, uh, but you have dimensions and you take the unique one, which is where you shrink this distance to zero. There's a basic representation. Just give you an example. In this largest, well, I should see, in this, this is the largest case. In this case, you find the super dimension is 24, but the dimension of this is, 11 million and something. That's the smallest dimension you have in this family as a very large, but it's the most interesting guy. And to describe it and construct it, you, you construct cuts modules, something like a Verma module. And it's a representation of power of two. It's like Spino. It's the only representation which is this funny product. And if you restrict it to the Lorentz group, so I should say the supergroup contains the classical conformal group. The conformal group contains the group you start with, the orthogonal group R, S. And in the four dimension case, this is the covering of the Lorentz group, the SL2. Yeah. And uh, you can restrict to this Lorentz group and look at the spins that occur if you restrict this gigantic representation, it decomposes, but only representations of spin lesser than two a person. That is what physicists are interested in because uh, you know, spin zero is scalar fields, one half is Dirac fields, uh, one is vector fields, three half is gravitinos and gravitation where's uh, spin two. So they are potential candidates for field theories. And you see the groups that occur here, I rewrote it from, from this eternal thing, from this tensor quotient. Uh, this is the tensor quotient, which simplifies. These groups are in four dimensions. These groups, and what you see is the groups that appear in, in the standard model. But these groups only appear if you go to the large families. So there might be a connection. And uh, the question is, would it be reasonable that it's really a connection in standard theory? I have no idea, I'm not a physicist, but there is a simple impression one could have if you are a physicist and make any experiment, uh, it is to my knowledge, you, you get a number, where you get a number, you, you compute something in a Feynman diagram, Feynman integrals. And what is a Feynman integral? You, I should write it down here. A Feynman integral It's something that is not quite well defined, but it doesn't matter really, because it's an integral or something that is not well defined. But you put in here a finite number of fields, and here some term e to the minus, which is defined. But the integration is not defined because it's uh, an equation of a, a space of distributions, which is only intuitively defined from my point of view. I've uh, um, at least the impression that it doesn't count because these injuries can be made sense out. And what are the fields? Uh, These are fields, or even the distribution. But you should uh, have better look at this. You take uh, the net infinity functions on your manifold, Minkowski space, but I take this compactification. So let's take ADS5 boundary or this projective compactification of Minkowski space. It's a compact space. You don't need compact support. You have values in a certain F, which is and that, that's the, and then you have distributions on that. On this space, so 
something where you can t e of phi and so on. Uh, they depend on variables and so on back and forth. It, I don't explain what a Feynman integral is, but it, it's an object which has values. It's in the classic case of a Dirac field, you have here R4, not the compactification of R4. And here, for instance, you have the spin off field, the C2 left in the case of the uh, standard model, or C4 in the case of classic Dirac equation, right? left and right combined. So the point is on this space, the group acts. Here it's Lorentz group in this classical case. Here it's the conformal group. And on this vector space, if the conformal group acts, so you have a representation, finite dimension, you can write something like the a field with values in a representation. And the point is, can you write a Lagrangian here? Here's an integral over a Lagrangian density, which is not well defined, but intuitively makes sense and gives you rules how to define it. You can indeed. Uh, if you take one of the representations in this list I had, yeah, for instance, this gigantic one or the smaller ones, these are representation of the supergroup. You have the supergroup acting on here and on here. So what does it help? Well, it helps because you can define a Lagrangian um, much in the same way as you write a Dirac operator. You have a kind of Dirac operator in the setting. Because of this high symmetry, you can write a Lagrangian. Usually in the Lagrangians for Dirac, you have terms like this. Yeah. Which means you have a bilinear form and an operator, a Dirac operator. The point is you have an operator which brings back functions to itself. Usually, if you have a connection, you get out of this space. You get if you take a connection or something like that, you land up in have something cotangent to cotangent bundle. Uh, if you are Lie algebraic, also here is something. And what does the Dirac operator do? You introduce the Clifford algebra and then you can multiply back. And you have here a similar situation because if you consider so called Cartan ge geometry, which is just the situation you have here. You take this conformal compactification, uh, anti decider boundary or whatsoever. You can write it because the super conformal group, this is also super, all super situation. The super uh, group acts transitively, and the kernel is a parabolic group. So this is a Kleinian geometry, it's a super parabolic. And so, in other words, M bar is a homogeneous space super space to be precise of this type. And you can do geometry like this. Instead of looking at fields here, you look at, at here, which, which are P equivariant. So usually the convention is you let it act from the right side on G. And the quotient is your, the space you are, are interested in originally. And then what you do is you look at a set of, uh, to get a Dirac operator, you look at, at a one form, A, which is what the physicists also call A, uh, if they have a field, a gauge field, this is a gauge field form. It's, it's a one form, where it's a one form on G with values in the Lie algebra of G. Well, this looks a little bit weird at the first sight, but you have a, a natural uh, derivative which maps this, or you can also, it is as well as in G. You have a natural derivative, which maps, you can also look at this, which maps one forms with value in an arbitrary representation of G. You see, a representation of G is a representation of P, and you can descend it to a vector bundle here. And instead of looking at, vector bundles on this space with valued in F, you can again view it here as an equivariant object. And then you can uh, write it like this, and you have a, a derivatives with maps to, to that. That's the usual covariant differentiation on, on G. You have the cotangent bundle, the algebra. But now if you have a map, which goes from here back, you're done. The composite is something like a Dirac operator. If you do this together, you have this. And if you add this, you can uh, also uh, apply, um, instead of the, the connection here, you can also write this 
we can also do this same same procedure once you have a map uh, equivalent thing from here to here but you have because you don't need a clifford algebra you have a representation and what is a representation it's a lee group homomorphism from the lee group a representation f super representation is a lee group map from the super lee group lee algebra g into f let us write it n f and what is n f it's the dual and so f in this tensor category aha what does it help if you dualize this map this map if you dualize it what is it it's a map you bring this g to the one to this side so you move the g to this side it becomes a g dual you move this f to this side it becomes a map of wait a minute of f we leave this we move it to this side because we dualized no it doesn't depend it's a map from here to here is this correct no g moved here sorry it's a map here from here to here that doesn't look nice because we want to go the other way around. But now you can dualize this again. And you place F by F dual. It doesn't matter. You replace F by F dual. You get a map from, from here to here in this direction. And this is the map you're looking for. You have to replace F by F dual. And you have to keep in mind that the Lie algebra has an invariant form so as a representation itself dual. I wrote it in the more geometric way, but this is G is isomorphic. And this gives a kind of Dirac operator. And together with this connection, you get all the tools you need for, uh, let's say, classical um, gauge theories. So it might be that in these theories, if you apply this field, if you make now such integrals, you have fields with values in F, and so F are their duals. These fields are self dual, I wrote down. I, and write down duals or f and so on. And you have uh, this is an invariant function, and you have an invariant volume element, or many, you have many uh, m copies of m in this Farman uh, integrals. But these are tensor contractions. The tensor rules of these categories determine what, what the outcome is. And what you have, but this is a function of a tensor, big tensor part of spaces, namely these fields, yeah, tensor, and this integral. It's a tensor with representations here. And this is homomorphism, this integral is a number. This is complex to see, the one dimensional representation. So it's a contraction operator. It's an equivariant map of tensor products of representations to the one dimensional representation. And now comes the point. This, if you decompose it, at least on this level here, without the dynamic variables in X, this map has to respect the tensor product rules. So the tensor products you do in here are highly complicated. I cannot comp compute a single example of this, uh, of this tensor product in, in dimension four. I never succeeded. But if you press it down here, the tensor rules become these of classical groups. And these are the groups I listed, U1, SU2, SU3. So if, by some miracle, these Feynman integrals have the property that summons which are here in the kernel have this property, have lower contribution asymptotically, depending on energy range. They are suppressed at least to first order. You might come up with the impression that these groups rule the Feynman integral. The truth is more complicated, of course, but an asymptotic expansion could happen. And this is a typical thing uh, that supersymmetry might produce cancellations. I have no idea whether this happens, these integrals. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Dimensionality, we have the super dimension zero. Yeah. And some quantities kind of is the, Yeah, the, the, the quantities, all the terms which, when you tensor out in, in decomposables, all the quantities, if, if those that are indecomposable and have super dimension zero, if these are suppressed, in the integral, in the sense that they uh, asymptotically uh, it doesn't contribute to the leading term. You might not see it in certain energy ranges that we are testing at the moment. And can we see this explicitly uh, using Feynman diagrams? It's extremely complicated. I, I did computer computations. 
I did not succeed. I could not even resolve one representation theory question. Namely, I was interested just to be, to be honest, this is complicated. It's 11 uh, million dimensional representation F. If I take the tensor product of this representation, it says approximately F squared times 10 to the, what is six, 12. Dimension is approximately this. I know it has at, at least uh, 1,000 uh, jordan hölder constituents. I do not know what the jordan hölder components are. I do not know what the Lewy filtration is. And the interesting thing that Lewy uh, represents is expected to have seven levels, seven layers, seven pieces. This socle, the maximum semi-simple part. And the top, the most interesting thing is this, it's the middle. But the interesting point is also here, because it's not semi-simple. If you have a map to something simple, you must have a one-dimensional representation on the top, because only the top survives if you map to a number. So it is interesting. Yeah, so that's, that's part of this philosophy. It's horrible, but it might be helpful, but you cannot compute anything. I do not know what the answer is. Here I tried on a computer, but non-simple simple objects, there's no good cohomologic algebra on that. You can extensions you can do, but I have no idea how to have uh, uh, adequate methods from mathematics to deal with it. I did it on a computer, but uh, my what is it? running on a computer brought problems because I, I always put data on a on a on an external drive and back and forth and back and forth. The system hangs up after. Uh, 10 hours or so, and I couldn't do this calculation. So it's just an example. On, I didn't even do a, a five mile integral in a, any complicated case. There is the simplest case with the SU2, I started computations, and, but I didn't do all computations, just started this. And there might be, indeed, the problem is you have to find the Langage and this contribution is, is complicated. And you have to do, you have to, really know what you what you uh, use as a Feynman integral. You have many uh, degrees of freedom to to define the Lagrangian. You can add terms. You have the curvature here, it's, as usual. You have curvature of this cartan connection. Um, A, you have a curvature term. You apply this uh, derivative twice. Curvature, which usually ap 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 uh, appears. But the, the, the truth is, you shouldn't even consider a usual connection, but a connection in the sense of, in the sense of quillen, which is, it's not a one form, but it's, you can add some odd forms in higher degree and so on. You have to go a little bit more complicated worlds perhaps. And so I'm not even sure what the right fine adjustments have to be. This is just a speculation, but let me end with one sentence, independently of this is nonsense or not. What is a matter of fact, once you accept that the conformal super group uh, of Minkowski fields is important, you cannot avoid these problems of this category. So whatever you, you do, uh, it must play a, a, a essential roles in computation of common. What the outcome is, whether it's this or not, I have no idea, but I think that's a matter of fact. That's mathematics, which rules behind the tensor products. Uh, the, 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 that's a simplification, even that is complicated and you can't avoid it. So that's, that's my final comment on that. I have a very naive question. Yeah. You mentioned uh, several times in this setting that four was an important. Yeah. Sort of the, so I, uh, what, how does it, this, the fact that things happening in, in real life are connected to have things being manifested in mathematics? Yeah, that's an old question in physics. I have no idea. So Erasmus, uh, no, what was the name, uh, uh, argued that only light propagation can only happen in, in, in certain dimension four or three plus one and so on. Uh, you can make many of these speculations. I, I, I wouldn't never dare to make a speculation like this. I'm not a physicist. I have no intuition for that. I can only see that this is a mathematical obstruction. If conformality, as a conformal inference of the Lagrangian is important, and if 
uh, supersymmetry is important. Then you cannot avoid this. And the rest is mathematics, and you have to think what are the conclusions, what they are, I have no idea. But in fact, if you believe in both, uh, dimension four is something which is uh, extreme. If you think at 10 dimensional super spaces, what you do, you don't have a, a full Lee super algebra. What you do is you, you play tricks, and I can tell you what, what they do because uh, you, it's always uh, difficult to say the world is like this and that. You, if you are in 10 dimensions, so you are 110, the conformal uh, space would be what, that, okay? 12 dimensions, sorry. SO210. And you don't have a, a conformal group with a nice property that it looks like. Uh, so if you look naively at something that looks like SO210 uh, uh, plus something, which is called, called R group, the physicist. Consider this is the, the even part, and the uh, and this G one, which is spin type. Whatever its spin means, you can have many copies. Doesn't matter. If you look at this, it's not possible, as I said. But what they do is, uh, and that's a nice substitute. Is uh, this is if you complexify it, it's easier to understand. Then um, you have. Let's say I go to the complex version. It's easier. Yeah, I tell you, as well complex. Uh, in this case, you have the spin representation. It's two to the six dimensional. It decomposes in two pieces, the spin, and it decomposes in S plus plus S minus, which is dimension two to the five, which is 32. So you have a, a map from there to there, and, and the, uh, the self-dual representation and the self-dual uh, pairing is odd. What you get is an embedding or a a faithful representation of this uh, group into the symplectic group because of this oddity of the self duality of this spin representation in 22 dimensions, 32 dimensions. And what you can look at here is uh, an extension where you replace this by this SPO. We had it before in this classification theorem. This one. Now, again, over complex numbers. This is odd 32 dimensional. And even one dimensional uh, form. This is super even and symplectic odd in classical sense. This group is a nice super Lie group or super Lie algebra uh, that exists. And of course, as a module under this group, this is a subgroup here, you can decompose this into SO12 plus auto complement, which is something. And then you can pull back the odd part and then push it there. But then your killing form, what does it do? So the, the odd part is exactly G minus spin representation. We did it like this, spinning ready. But then you get the spin here. But if you take the anti-commutator of two spinners, so this BXX, well, what does it put out? It puts out a sum of an element here. It's a component X from here small x or let's say c from here, plus a component from the auto complement in this symplectic group. This is some, some, this is some complement. And if this is easier, if I remember correctly, if you decompose the symplectic group, group classical one into, uh, wait a minute, SP32 is as a module of the smaller group S12, so 12, um, as 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 of twelve modules, I think you get here the alternating fifth power of the standard representation, twelve dimensional standard representation, and this gives you twelve a five form. It can be interpreted as a five form, alternating five form, a section of this bundle five form on uh, R twelve. And what physicists do, this is, this is not a super Lie algebra anymore. It's, it's a term which doesn't fit in. And you can even not put it into an R because it's a direct sum. It's only existing in the symplectic group, not in the orthogonal one. But what they do is they embed S5, five sphere, and this I, I, RDS, anti decidual space, uh, five. And here they restrict. Uh, uh, section of this bundle of this Lie algebra, super Lie algebra and integrate our S5 
the, uh, the pullback, and that's a I, I of a star of, of this form, whatever the form is, uh, differential form. Yeah? And by this integration, you kill this uh, part. What you end up is, you see, RS5, which is again the SO whose form symmetry which acts on here. So that's uh, how they, uh, uh, so it, it cannot answer such a question because uh, and this is very natural, uh, you know, string theory in 10 dimensions is the only uh, realistic, uh, but the no Gauss theorem, no Gauss theorem. You have to have a full string theory, some higher dimensions, but that's the way they, in some of their models, uh, uh, work around this problem, yeah. Okay. Uh, for G2 dash 2. Yeah. Because it doesn't have to work out uh, anything with the homology, uh, homology schemes. I mean, uh, is the topology on the infinite polar? Yeah. Uh, this topology here, these are algebraic groups. And uh, that's important. <laughs> um, these groups are affine group schemes, each single one. So it means what an algebraic group is. It's not a group in it's in, in truth, it's a hop algebra. We dualize the category of, of algebraic groups is dual to the category of hop algebras. And the hop algebras, this projective limit becomes an inductive limit. And it's affine hop algebras, an inductive limit of affine hop algebras is an affine hop algebra, but over an infinite dimensional uh, ring. So that's in fact an algebraic group scheme, which is not of finite type, or an algebraic supergroup scheme. Also, it looks like a product. There's no topology. And in terms of algebraic geometry or algebraic supergroup, it's a Hopf algebra, which is a union, an inductive limit of sub Hopf algebras, which are very nice, finite dimensional. And uh, that's, that's the way you should look at it. It's something purely algebraic, and no topology at all. 